She spent two years in Uganda with the Voluntary Services Overseas Organization, and together with Andy Ware, an international blade shearing champion, and their two children are now farming 3,000 head of livestock and welcome between 10 and 15,000 visitors to their farm in Somerset uh, each year. They have high hopes to develop their passion for wool fashion. And Jen's subject is wool, an ancient fiber with a resilient future. Jen. A very good morning to you all. I am Jennifer Hunter, and I consider myself to be very fortunate and extremely busy. We have combined livestock with people farming in an area of outstanding natural beauty, and our rural interpretation centre is gradually taking shape since buying a redundant pile of expensive rubble on top of Cheddar Gorge in Somerset. Wool is one of our most replenishing resources and after years of being frustrated with harvesting and marketing and hearing words like these, Andy said to me, don't tell me, tell Nuffield Farming. I would like to start the day with appreciation to my family, the textile ladies in Bristol, and especially to the Nuffield Farming Trust and to my sponsors, the Company of Merchants for the Staple of England, for recognizing my motivation, determination, and passion to research a historic complex fibre. I can never conduct any speech without sharing my immense gratitude to Andy, for without his focus and holistic shepherding skills, I would never had a reason to harvest the true potential of our wool fibres. Our children here, Kyle and Seth, have understood and respected my time away, and finding this space, I sensed how to grow a family business. So the time has come for me to deliver my chosen words, for I'm just the facilitator. Wool is an international language, and these ancient fibres have a very resilient future. When I started this mission, I had a lot of questions. As a sheep farmer, we often have no connection with wool once it leaves the farm, and I had no previous exposure to the textile industry. To create a range of woolen products, I knew I needed to familiarize myself with processing concepts. What was also really important was time. We have none of this to spare and everything to gain by insisting on a non-toxic textile movement. British wool is generally considered as a byproduct from the sheep meat industry. And in 2009, when our finest Shetland fleeces were valued at 12 pence per kilo, I decided this is just not acceptable. But to sell our wool privately, we needed to add value at shearing, consider transport logistics, colours and quantities to receive a premium. There are no wool classification courses or equipment available in the UK, so I created this simple grading system. Selling direct to spinners, we generally remove about a third to guarantee our yarns are of consistent high quality. It became obvious we needed more volume to suit processing machinery and to educate buyers about high-bred vigour to regain faith in our commercial cross-bred fibres. But how can we sell a commodity without data? The wool testing authorities offer internationally recognised fibre tests that provide micron diameter, length, strength and contamination information. This service is available to all sheep farmers but prices are high due to the lack of demand across Europe. After a decade with these questions, I was more than ready to find solutions, and I hope you too can appreciate these messages from around the world. I attended this multi-stakeholder event in Brussels with over 100 delegates. The International Wool Textile Organization attracts members from many industries, and their continued research and development in the world's leading animal fibre confirmed my belief that wool is far more than just a byproduct. It's a protein and mineral resource, a raw material for a host of other industries, and what we do or don't do at growers makes a difference. 
at the social dinner, lacking innovation came along right after these three words. Said in light-hearted jest, <laughs> the words pale, male and stale refer to how the Southern Hemisphere see the British wool industry leaders. <laughs> <laughs> in reflection, I was also made aware of this second statement from an all-ladies weaving team. Bristol and Copenhagen have both been awarded the status of Green Capital of Europe. Wool is an obvious fibre of choice, and recycling messages like ethical and practical, affordable for all, suitable for every occasion, and encouraging an active lifestyle is what drives and connects both cities. Slow textiles, environmental profit and loss accounts, and the Nordic initiative, clean and ethical, are challenging sustainable fashion. Students and designers are interested in regional fabrics with a sound ethical story and are raising the demand for naturally coloured fibres. As a result, we are sending these hangers to the fabric source in Copenhagen. Collaboration is also knocking on our door. Wool is only 1% of the textile industry, and our long wool and primitive breeds represent 0.3% of this tiny niche market. This made us feel positive, but equally poor, as fine lustre fibres require the highest level of finishing to really make them shine. A very recent conference in France with 15 wool growing countries identified the lack of training for farmers and early processing frustrations. Wool is often burnt or buried, and this is nonsense. Wool is flame retardant, highly versatile, and virtually grows for free when we produce meat. We have the genetic database, a trusted processing heritage, and together with environmental control, we can offer that transparent story needed to sell a gift that will last a lifetime. Our Contemporary Scholars Conference was in Australia and I left our year group with mixed emotions as I felt such strong connections with faces that I didn't always agree with. There was only one reference to the textile industry and that was cotton, yet I believe textiles are an essential element when discussing the global population the growing concern. The most polluting industry in the world is agriculture, and the second is the textile industry. The Australians invest a lot into innovation, and the creation of the next to skin range is a new cool wool concept. Wear wool all year round, as it offers protection against harmful UV rays, helps our skin breathe and can be thrown in the washing machine at 40 degrees C. Layers are the best way we can control our body temperatures, and light, soft fabrics are the results of years of genetic selection. Reducing micron and increasing fleece weight is the main focus in most merino flocks. Sarah Moran, pictured here behind this grading table, is the Australian wool handling champion, and I appreciate the speed, care and attention required to divide each fleece to gain that on-farm added value. Wool classification happens right across the Southern Hemisphere and I stayed on a mixed farm owned by two instructors for the Savory Institute and Avis 21, right in the heart of Patagonia. Never before has anyone referred to skin thickness when growing wool and meat. The multi-purpose merino, with its soft rolling skin, finishes as a heavy lamb carcass while growing a longer staple fleece for a combined 50-50 income. Aiming for, air, for an eight-month shearing rotation, this 18 micron wool is classified at shearing, will contribute to the six million hectare grassland restoration project and be marketed under the Patagonia Limited Sustainable Wool Programme. This concept offers consumers the chance to pay a higher price that they themselves have demanded, knowing what they are buying is helping rather than hindering our struggling planet. The Icelandic breed has always been a multi-purpose sheep 
and every ewe is considered pedigree, with records monitoring meat from milk, fleece colour, and over 40 recognised markings very similar to the Shetland breed. Their unique double-coated fleeces are short, delicate fibres mixed with durable hair-like fibres, offering the perfect combination to survive 65 degrees north. Sheep produce 25% of Iceland's income, the wool is subsidised by the government and processed into the iconic Lopi knitting yarn. Lopi literally means half spun and creates a light, soft, warm and textured yarn. Recognising our similar fibres, we are now selling a Shetland Lopi yarn here in the UK. Our yarns are 100% wool, have a transparent processing chain within the UK and are fully traceable back to our sheep. Producing wool is easy though, processing is expensive, but marketing is something else and I knew I had to embrace this challenge. Four levels of processing to explore marketing through the ages left a strong impression to incorporate felt into our product range and that consumers need to find these products easily and like to buy a gift set complete with knitting patterns. I always felt this mission needed to take a few steps back in time to find a positive new path forward. And the essence of my research was captured the moment I met this Mapuche couple in Chile. For once every year, they load up their oxen and cart and spend a day by the river, light a fire and wash their Suffolk cross fleeces. A moment later, he answers his mobile phone. <laughs> to conclude these global messages, consumers want to feel the softness. They like to know where it's from. They want to see a social value along the processing chains and understand how their motives for buying natural products will benefit the environment. It's also true to say, inspirational young women were active in all the places our visitors and as I stand here am I, I am a voice for all those that consider wool is worth their investment. Sheep are efficient land management tools and British farmers should be thankful to have ample grass to feed our dual purpose genetics. Wool is without doubt a replenishing resource and we have a marketing board that is responsive and is now selling British fleeces individually and in variable quantities to supply the wool renaissance. As fibre growers, we should harvest all the components within a fleece, that's the fibres, the minerals, the lanolin, and we should listen to those who want to buy and use our product, even when it's a byproduct, and especially when it's a niche product. I believe I am yet to discover the true meaning of becoming an off-field scholar, but to be a connoisseur of fine wool and discovering innovation for these ancient fibres has to be the most rewarding task fate has brought my way. And long may it last. Let's keep these skills alive. Thank you.